uh, everyone. I'm Dr. Gandapati from Apollo Hospital, Chennai. I'm going to talk on a spinal cord protection for thoracoabdominal aortic surgeries. So uh, my uh, lecture will be on the basis of introduction, surgical management, spinal cord injury pathophysiology, risk factors, spinal cord injury protection protocol, and spinal fluid uh, drainage. So um, spinal cord injury is a dreaded complication of descending thoracic aortic and thoracoabdominal aortic surgeries. Spinal cord protection protocols are in place for quite some time, but uh, a lot of uh, people, a lot of um, anesthesia faculties in this area are not very comfortable with it. Uh, maybe because uh, they do very less uh, cases of uh, thoracoabdominal uh, aneurysm surgeries. The, the vascular surgery centers where these type of uh, cases happen or uh, uh, pretty low on specialized. So it is uh, concentrated in those centers. So those areas, the spinal cord protection protocols are in place. And cerebrospinal fluid drainage is the most studied method. I will go through it uh, one by one. So these are the types of uh, dissections and aneurysms. As you can see, my pointer, uh, this is uh, dissection, aortic dissection types, Dibicki type 1, type 2, and type 3. Dibicki type 1 is where the dissection starts from the ascending aorta and goes up to the uh, uh, yeah, uh, iliac branching and uh, type 2 is the and uh, dissection is restricted to the ascending iota alone. It is not beyond left subclavian artery and type 3 is the dissection which is beyond left subclavian artery up to the abdominal iota branching. It is classified as uh, Stanford type A and type B according to the uh, treatment protocol because whichever involves the ascending aorta like Stanford A, both picky type 1 and type 2, they need emergency surgery, emergency surgery as early as possible. Then only we can save the patient. Uh, the type B or the Dibicki type 3 aneurysms can be managed conservatively initially and we can go for T-bar later. And coming to aneurysm, there are four types, CRAFO type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. Uh, CRAFO type 1 is the aneurysm extending from the uh, left subclavian artery and below diaphragm above the renal artery branches. CRAFO type 2 aneurysms extending from the left subclavian artery and goes up to the uh, uh, abdominal aortic branching and Crawford type 3 is the aneurysm extending from the lower third of the thoracic iota and go up to the iliac branching of the iota and Crawford type 4 is the aneurysm starting from the diaphragmatic area of the thoracoabdominal iota up to the iliac branching. So coming to surgical management, uh, generally it is an open repair uh, with a big incision from the thorax to the abdomen. It is a continued J-shaped uh, incision, which is a pretty big incision and a morbid surgery. And uh, the other, that is for thoracoabdominal aneurysm. For abdominal aneurysm, they do a big laparotomy. And uh, the other... Uh, management procedures are endovascular repair of the descending thoracic aorta and endovascular repair of the thoracoabdominal aorta. Coming to open repair, it is a exceptionally high-risk surgery. As I told you, that for a thoracoabdominal surgery, the incision happens from here up to here. It's a pretty big incision. And the mortality rate is 15 to 18 percent, even in high volume center. And in low volume center, it can go up to 26 to 30 percent. That is pretty high. Almost one third to one fourth of the patient have mortality in these type of uh, repairs. And uh, this mortality and morbidity extends with the correlation of the extent of the repair. Only abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs uh, and the Crawford type 4, I mean, are met with lower mortality. But the type 1 and type 2 
Crawford classification of, uh, of aneurysms, the mortality and morbidity is pretty high. But this open repairs are durable and low rate of uh, reintervention uh, uh, low rate of reintervention is uh, uh, needed and the preferred approach for young patients, especially those with connective tissue disease. And uh, the open repair is indicated for selective older patients also with anatomy not amenable to endovascular repair. And coming to endovascular repair of the descending thoracic aorta, the famously called it T bar, T bar, the transcatheter endovascular aortic repair. So the thoracic endovascular and aortic repair have increased dramatically recently. A lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies are coming with the stents suitable for TVAR. And the technology is uh, improving day by day and they're coming with more and more efficient devices and stents. And uh, this procedure obviously is a minimally invasive procedure done in cath lab under fluoroscopic guidance. And it demonstrated low mortality and morbidity. Recently, the Society of Vascular Surgery Practice Guidelines recommend TVAR over open repair for isolated descending thoracic aortic aneurysms. The benefits of TVAR are avoiding, avoiding thoracotomy, avoiding left heart bypass, which may need may be needed in a, a, a thoracobdominal aneurysm repair because of clamping too many areas. And aortic cross clamp, obviously, we avoid, and massive blood loss is avoided. Uh, note this point the thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm surgeries are met with a lot of massive blood loss. And it is a prolonged surgery. When we start in the morning, generally it goes up to uh, uh, evening or afternoon. And it's a prolonged surgery, and the pulmonary art injury is possible because of one lung ventilation is needed. We have to mobilize so much of lungs and end organ ischemia is a possibility because we are clamping a lot of areas of uh, the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, coming to uh, concerns. So uh, these are benefits of endovascular repair by avoiding the uh, complications of surgery and coming to the concerns of uh, TVAR. Concerns of endovascular repair, endo leak can happen because the seal may not be uh, uh, proper from the stent to the aortic uh, wall and aneurysm growth may not be prevented. So here we are not replacing the diseased aorta. We are just putting a stent and applying it so that to prevent the aortic rupture. So the aneurysmal growth may not be prevented if the seal is not adequate or if the endo leak is present. And there is a possibility of graft migration. The stent can move up and down and causing failure of the procedure. Coming to endovascular repair of the thoracoabdominal aorta. Previously, we have I have talked about the thoracic descending thoracic aorta. Now we are talking about thoracoabdominal aorta. Both thorax and abdominal aorta involved in the aneurysm. Then we are go for endovascular repair of thoracoabdominal aorta. This is a bit more morbid. We are uh, uh, two segments of uh, uh, descending aorta is involved. So the two types of uh, endovascular uh, repair available here are the endovascular repair with fenestrations or branches for visceral vessels. Obviously, when we involve the abdominal aorta, there is a uh, renal artery branches, there is a uh, superior mesenteric uh, artery, inferior mesenteric artery, the celiac artery branches. All these things are happening. So when we put a stent, all these will get blocked. So we should have branches in the uh, for these visceral vessels in the uh, stent itself or fenestrations for this. Only thing is, this is technically more demanding. And another thing is, TVAR combined with open visceral deep branching, in which the bypass grafts are created from visceral vessels to iliac arteries. So those will support. Uh, supply the visceral uh, branches and you put a stent and come out. So concerns in fever are they are technically challenging. High rate of re-intervention is needed. Most common indication is endo leak for re-intervention. Uh, so coming to spinal cord injury, the the uh, uh, the thing we are concerned and we are coming to the topic of uh, today's uh, class, the spinal cord injury. What is the pathophysiology for it? See, 
whenever we do thoraco abdominal aneurysm surgery or t bar for thoraco abdominal aneurysms there is possibility of loss of spinal cord perfusion with the interruption of blood supply by the graft so to understand this we should know what is spinal cord perfusion pressure for example what is perfusion pressure of the heart it is map minus left ventricular diastolic pressure similarly for spinal cord what is the perfusion pressure it is the mean arterial pressure minus cerebro spinal fluid pressure the csf pressure or the central venous pressure whichever is higher so that is the spinal cord perfusion pressure so how to improve the spinal cord perfusion either you increase map or decrease cerebro spinal fluid pressure or cv here what is possible for us during surgery we can possibly re reduce the cerebro spinal fluid pressure so that the spinal cord perfusion pressure improves and there is no possibility of spinal cord ischemic injury that is the basis of this aortic cross clamp increases csf pressure or cvp and thereby worsens the spinal cord perfusion pressure spinal cord ischemia causes edema which may further reduce spinal cord perfusion what is the spinal cord blood supply it is a single anterior spinal artery the anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries so there are, there are three arteries supplying the spinal cord throughout from top to bottom these two are all the three arteries the anterior spinal artery and the two posterior spinal arteries are uh, uh, originating from vertebral artery the collaterals for the whole length of uh, spinal cord the anterior spinal artery and posterior spinal artery arises from various intercostal arteries and lumbar vessels which in which starts from the abdominal aorta a special mention about artery of adam kivix the artery of adam kivix is the largest intercostal artery which gives collaterals to the spinal cord that is to the posterior spinal and the anterior spinal artery mainly the anterior spinal artery and uh, the i and another thing is it supplies mainly the lower thoracic aorta and supplies the anterior spinal cord so here you can see this is the zone 5 for um, uh, for uh, comfort sake aorta is divided into zone so this is zone 0 from starting from the aortic valve up to the innominate artery zone 1 is up to the left common carotid artery zone 2 is up to the left subclavian artery zone 3 is in the descending thoracic aorta top middle is uh, zone 4 and lower descending thoracic aorta is zone 5 and beyond that zone 6 7 8 9 10 11 11 here we are concerned mainly about zone 5 which is supplied by artery of adam kivix this area is in danger of spinal cord ischemia when artery of adam kivix is blocked because of the either stenting or open uh, aortic aneurysm repair what what you do in open aortic aneurysm repair you dissect and throw the aneurysmal area and put a uh, stent aortic stent and manually sew so that is the open um, uh, surgery for aortic aneurysm repair so here when those intercostal arteries are blocked mainly the uh, artery of adam kivix the spinal cord in this area zone 5 area is under risk and another a uh, point which is under uh, concern is zone 2 where the left subclavian artery arises so the left subclavian artery only gives rise to vertebral artery which in uh, which in turn uh, forms the anterior spinal and uh, posterior spinal arteries so if this area is also affected by stenting or something the possibility of spinal cord ischemia occurs and uh, this is the uh, anatomical diagram for uh, your uh, spinal cord supply this is the spinal cord and this is the uh, arch of aorta which the left subclavian artery from where the vertebral artery arises and which is um, forms the branches of uh, anterior and posterior spinal arteries as you can see these intercostal arteries are uh, forming the collaterals to the uh, spinal cord blood supply similarly the abdominal aorta the lumbar collaterals are 
formed here. And why the artery of adder cubix is uh, important? Because it, it forms the largest collateral supply for the lower aspect of the thoracic aorta. Unfortunately, it may be anatomical variations. It may be present here. It may be present here somewhere. Most commonly in the zone 5. So, whenever we whenever we occlude those areas, uh, the possibility of uh, Spinal cord ischemia is very high. And as you can see here, when we put the stent in the descending thoracic aorta, as you can see, this is the stent is uh, put beyond the left subclavian artery and the stent is going up to uh, the diaphragm, which blocks the, the landing zone goes beyond the uh, artery of Adam Kivix. When you put like this, this area of the spinal cord is in the risk of uh, ischemia. But here, as you can see, when the abdominal aortic uh, stenting, abdominal aortic uh, stenting is done here, uh, the artery of Adam Kivix is not very much uh, under risk. So in this, the spinal cord ischemia is pretty rare. And what is spinal cord uh, ischemia definition? It is immediate onset or late onset, uh, the delayed onset. Immediate onset is defined as Lower extremity weakness on emergence from anesthesia within 24 hours of the procedure. Delayed onset is defined as a lower extremity weakness that follows a normal postoperative neurological examination after emergence from anesthesia. Coming to risk factors and protective factors for the spinal cord injury in descending thoracic iota and thoracoabdominal aortic repair and proposed mechanisms. There are anatomical factors patient specific factors and post operative or delayed uh, spinal cord ischemia the sci what are the anatomical risk factors the extent of the coverage where we have to the disease extent of the disease where we have to repair the artery if it is more or it is anatomically important areas then the chance of sci is more and the endovascular distended distant landing zone a landing zone means the where the this will part of the stent six. That is the landing zone. If the zone involves five to ten, then the chance of paraplegia or a spinal cord ischemia is more. Abdominal aortic aneurysm, prior aortic repairs. Uh, abdominal uh, triple A means five zone five to ten abdominal aortic aneurysm and prior aortic repairs and number of pattern lumbar arteries. These are all influence the chances of spinal cord ischemia. And urgent and emergent repairs obviously influence are more risky for spinal cord ischemia because of underdeveloped collaterals or hemodynamic instability. And uh, the protective factors, what are the protective anatomical factors or distal aortic perfusion and motor evoked potential guided reimplantations of intercostals. Here, we maintain the perfusion during cross clamp and restore the collateral perfusion respectively. So, these are all favorable factors to avoid spinal cord ischemia. What are the patient-specific factors? Age, CAD, CKD, smoking, COPD, hypertension, and non-white rays are riskier for spinal cord ischemia. These are markers of atherosclerosis likely affecting the collaterals. Uh, and there is a racial disparity in spinal cord ischemia which needs further investigation and what are the protective factors hereditary aortic disease because of this if the problem happens then there is less atherosclerosis of collaterals and they would have had a better uh, collateral supply so they don't go for spinal cord ischemia and the post-operative related uh, spinal cord ischemia can be happen because of after major surgery, there is a possibility of bleeding. There is a possibility of uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, instability, which may cause reduced MAP and which in turn causes spinal cord ischemia. So those should be avoided by augmenting the MAP and maintaining the hemodynamics in post-procedure. So coming to spinal cord protection protocol. So, so far we have seen spinal cord uh, ischemia pathophysiology and uh, the anatomical uh, blood supply of the uh, spinal cord and uh, what are the risk factors and uh, causes for that. And now we come how to treat it or prevent 
spinal cord ischemia. These are all spinal cord protection protocol, mainly CSF drainage and MAP augmentation and increased hematocrit transfusion threshold, hypothermia, pharmacological adjuncts, and neuromonitoring. Uh, so these are the various uh, uh, points of uh, uh, the protocols to uh, uh, to reduce the spinal cord ischemia. And this tabular column you can go through and I will explain one by one. Um, and this coming to cerebrospinal fluid drainage, this is uh, strongly recommended by European and United States guidelines after high risk open and endovascular attack. So what are the uh, indication for open cases? Type 1 to 3 thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs. If you remember the Crawford classification, type 1, type 2, and type 3 thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs are high risk for um, uh, paraplegia or spinal cord ischemia because it includes zone 5, the artery of Adam Kubik's area. So that is why the cerebrospinal fluid drainage is indicated in this area repairs and case by case basis for type 4 generally we do uh, uh, the uh, ct scan and uh, pictures and exactly where uh, when we are planning for uh, the thoracobdominal aortic uh, surgery or endovascular repair where to where uh, the stent has to be placed or where to where the abdominal aorta has to be replaced with the stent in open repair then we come to idea whether the artery of Adam Kivix is in uh, risk or not, and then we decide whether to go for cerebrospinal fluid drainage or not. Uh, so the indication for endovascular cases, the cerebrospinal fluid drainage, where we are planning, or uh, thoracic ab abdominal aortic aneurysm extend one to three types, where again it involves the artery of Adam Kivix area, the zone five, and the extent of coverage is longer, more than 15 to 20 centimeter. If you cover aortic zone 5, if there is chances of compromised spinal cord collateral because of atherosclerosis, because of CKD, CAD, um, smoking, COPD, all those things, and possibility of occluded internal iliac or uh, vertebral artery, and history of prior aortic repair. And how will you do uh, the CSF fluid drainage? CSF uh, fluid drainage Generally, we insert uh, epidural catheter in lumbar areas uh, L23 or uh, L34 or L345 uh, in a comfortable position and insert the epidural catheter into the series of space, the spinal, uh, so as a spinal drainage catheter and uh, fix it and bring it out. And the zero level is your phlebostatic axis and keep the drainage catheter fixed above 10 centimeters or above the zero level so that the CSF pressure will be maintained at 10 millimeters of mercury. If it goes beyond that, it will drain. So this is how we set up. So we have to maintain 10 millimeters of mercury or less than that. So this how and drainage we aim limited to 20 ml per day. Drain removed after 48 hours. So it can be continued up to five to seven days if there is concern for spinal cord ischemia or hemodynamic instability or due to coagulopathy. This is how uh, we set it up. Sterility is very important with sterile gown and drapes and uh, so that the complications of uh, infection or meningitis and it is life-threatening. So we have to be very careful and uh, the thread the catheter 10 centimeter into the space. As I told you, the zero drain at the phlebostatic axis, axis uh, which is nothing but mid axillary line and uh, at the level of uh, uh, T4. And consider starting drain height at a pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. This will maintain CS of pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury if allowed to drain continuously. Ideal is 5 to 15 ml per hour. Limit 20 ml per hour. This is how uh, previously I told wrongly 20 ml per day. It is actually 20 ml per hour. So you should not go beyond that. And wait one hour after drain placement before starting any heparin. That is true for any uh, epidural procedures. And the complications of CS of drainage are catastrophic. It can be neuroaxial hematoma. It can be intracranial bleeding resulting from excessive drainage, drain fracture with a retained catheter requiring surgical removal. Obviously, the epidural catheter gets stuck 
in the uh, uh, spinal uh, spinal cord area and meningitis the infection and the catheter failure drain malfunction with delayed paralysis and bloody CSO drainage which is commonly associated with intracranial hemorrhage which is again a catastrophic complication <laughs>